You know what? It helps if I turn the microphone on. So, Joseph, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> What's up, guys? Well, I'm going to repeat everything I just said. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to, when we publish this later, I'm going to edit this video, edit those first two and a half minutes out. So basically at the beginning, I, you know, I talked about how we're going to be talking about, um, it's like a total newbie era. That's why I have Robbie on. It's one of the many reasons why I have Robbie on. One of which is he would have told me a lot sooner that he couldn't have heard. <laughs> so apparently the microphone, uh, when I was moving it, I, uh, I must have somehow, let me, in fact, let me do this real quick. I must have somehow knocked it knocked it off so i was talking about how tom white so he's one of our students he was like he asked me do i want to know why he bought and i said you know i yeah i thought about it for like two seconds because he was basically going to say uh here's why i bought you're going to understand a customer better and he talked about how the deciding factor for him was that he found this blog post uh in mattmcwilliams.com that i'd written like four or five years before three four or five years before talking about the time I was arrested, faced 42 years in prison. Now, if you want that full, the whole story, again, I just, as I said earlier, go to mattmcwilliams.com, search for the word handcuffs, uh, search for the word arrested. There's probably not a whole lot on there about that. And Tom told me that when he read that post, he knew he could trust me 100%. If I was willing to share that really dark part of my life and admit to screwing up, then I would be open and transparent in my dealings with him going forward. So that's the power of being open, honest, and, and you know personal, which we talked about two weeks ago. If you remember, we talked about how, um, you know, we talked about how to create raving fans. And one of the things I talked about was you got to get personal. You got to be open. You got to be transparent. Like, if you think I like sharing that story, you're, you're wrong. I am not like sitting by the fire in my ugly Christmas sweater on Christmas Eve saying like, you know, gather around children. Let's talk about the time daddy had to be handcuffed. You know, daddy had to go in and get fingerprinted. Like, like. Like even just talking about that now causes a certain level of pain. It's not a, it's not a story I like telling, but you know, like, I mean, I have visions right now. This is 20 years ago, 20 years ago. I think about the time when I walked out of the sheriff's office and I had the handcuffs on. And one of the things I learned is if, you know, if you look at the pictures of like people coming out of the sheriff's office, they're always going like that uh, in the local news, right? They're always going, it's not because they're trying to, you know, hide their face. It's because the sheriff's office opened directly into the sun. <sighs> I don't know how, like how that was even possible at that time of day, but it opened directly in the sun. I'm like, Whoa, that's bright, you know? And I couldn't put sunglasses on because well, I had handcuffs on. So every time I tell that story, that gets a little bit easier. I can tell it now and it's a little bit painful, but every time I share it, it draws people to me. It's an important part of my story. It's an important part of who I am. And if I leave it out, it's an opportunity lost to create trust. And so today we're going to talk about how to stand out. That story is one of the ways I can stand out. There's not a ton of online marketers who have that story. Certainly not exactly my story. And again, I, I shared in detail on my blog. I won't go into that. But uh, I was thinking earlier, I just recorded episode 450 of my podcast. 450 episodes. I've released, I think, 446, 447 of those. I'm not sure. So I get a lot of questions from listeners. You know, uh, just at least every couple of days, I get a really good question that I love answering. And one of my listeners recently asked me, said, Matt, I am in such a crowded industry. How do I stand out? How do I stand out from the crowd? Because it seems like everyone's just a clone of each other. And I don't want to be just another clone. Getting noticed today, this is what I told him, getting noticed today is easier than at any point in human history. But standing out is harder than ever. It's like, it's kind of a catch-22, you know? Uh, getting noticed, building a following of a few hundred people on Facebook, a few hundred people on Instagram, a few hundred people on Twitter, getting a few, sub, you know, 100 subscribers to your, to your email list. Uh, it's easier than ever. Easier than ever. But standing out is harder than ever. If you're going to capture your avatar's attention in a noisy world, you need to stand out. So of course the question is, how do you stand out? How do you stand out in such a crowded, noisy, and distraction-free 
or distraction filled world. I saw your comments, Charles and Brendan said, you can't see or hear. I'm wondering if you're a little bit behind, if you're not live. Um, yeah, as far as the video, I know the video is working. I see it, but I'm not sure why it wouldn't be for you, Chad. Um, so sorry about that. Um, yeah. So of course the question is how in the heck do you stand out? Um, yeah, I think you guys might just be a little bit latent. Um, maybe you're a little bit behind. So when you catch up to this part, you'll know why you couldn't, uh, heard or you couldn't hear earlier. It was actually just cause I forgot to turn the microphone. I, I think I had it on. Um, just didn't, uh, you know, nudged it when I moved it earlier. So how do you stand out? Well, I'm going to share four ways how you can differentiate yourself. I've shared these in the past. If you're a podcast listener, if you're a podcast listener, just drop, uh, just type the word podcast. Let me know you're a podcast listener. You listen to the affiliate guy. If you're not, if you're not, um, let me know, let me know, um, as well. Just say, you know, I don't listen to the podcast yet. Uh, and we'll get you a link so you can do that. Um, somebody's logged into Facebook as me <laughs> and it set, says that they're able to hear all good. I don't know who on my team that is. Um, <laughs> but I, apparently I just left a comment that that was funny. All right. So how do you stand out? Well, there's four ways that we're going to dive into those. If you, if I shared these on the podcast before, but not nearly as in depth as I'm going to share them today. Uh, I have some exercises for you today that I'm going to go into. So even if you've heard these before, you haven't heard everything. The first way you can stand out is your style and personality. And we're going to dive in deep into each of these. Secondly, your experience. Thirdly, your background. And fourth, your method. So let's start with style and personality. Your style and personality, they work together uniquely to determine the way that you express yourself. Okay. What's a unique way? And just so I know, when I ask these questions, when I say, what's a unique way that you communicate who you are, how you help others and convey your message? Don't just gloss over that question. Think, what is a unique way that I communicate? Maybe grab a journal. I hope you're taking notes today. If you're not, go grab some paper and a pen or whatever device you, you take your notes on. I just, I prefer paper and pen person. Grab a journal, write that down. What's a unique way? You don't have time. Maybe you want to listen to what I'm saying. You don't have time to write it all down now. Um, well, then think about it. Write it down and think about that. And David, David, go to mattmcwilliams.com forward slash podcast. mattmcwilliams.com forward slash podcast. Subscribe to the podcast. You do not want to miss some of the upcoming episodes. I've, I've got some good ones. I'm doing an interview today. I think it'll be episode 451. So good. So good. Um, all right. So what's a unique way that you communicate? What's a unique way that you help others? What's a unique way you can convey message? This could be your writing style. This could be your speaking style. This could be your, your physical appearance your clothes. Like those are things that stand out within seconds. And anyone who follows me online, and, and if you're not subscribed, you should subscribe. Just go to mattmcwilliams.com, find any of the myriad of ways to subscribe, join my email list. You'll know that I don't write, like my emails are not written in a way that would please my English teachers growing up, right? Like my email, I, they would be full of red ink, all right? I do not write my emails for the approval of Mrs. Sisson. Sorry, miss. If you're still alive, you know, sorry. She was my English, my senior AP English professor. I do not write for the grammar police. Okay. In my emails, my blogs, my social media posts, I write for conversions. I write to lead people to take action, whether it's to respond to a question or to click a link or purchase a product. I don't frankly give a crap if Mrs. Sisson would fill my email or my post with red ink. I just don't care. So my writing style is a bit unique. I use improper punctuation to make a point. Uh, I end sentences with a preposition, right? Um, I, uh, I sometimes fail to end a sentence with any punctuation at all and put an emoji. <laughs> like that's right. That's how I write. I use unrelated stories to inject humor, to attract eyeballs to my content. Um, one of the examples of that was, uh, I, I actually wrote an email to, uh, I don't know if, who saw this, but I wrote an email to attract people to, uh, uh, that, that podcast episode that I talked about, about, you know, talking about this on a, on a kind of a higher level. And the, the subject line was shorts plus boots equals winning combo. 
had one of the highest open rates in the entire year. And the whole, the, the, the email, and if you're on my email list, just go search for that, you know, that subject line shorts, the, the plus sign boots equals winning combo. I wrote about this guy I saw in a store and this, this dude had on, I'm not joking, middle of winter, it's 30 degrees outside. He, he had a kind of a curly haired kind of mullet esh thing, had a shirt that may or may not have fit him like a decade before, but it didn't anymore. And if he so much as went like this, you were getting a face full of belly. He had on like some shorty, um, they're like, they look like they were almost cut off sweatpants, but they were a little like about four inches too short. And boots. And I looked at my wife and we saw, we both saw them together and I looked at her and she goes, don't you dare. I'm like, take, <laughs> I had to, it was like, I followed him around the store until I could find a way to take a picture of this guy. And I took a picture of him and I was talking about how like, you know what, of everybody in the store, that dude stood out, but you don't have to look like him to stand out. So that was the gist of the email, right? That's a kind of a weird story. Um, I think about like, when I think about standing out in style, I think of uh, Chris Rock. I heard an interview with him like, I don't know, probably 10 years ago. And the host was like, you're nothing in person. When I'm hanging out with you, you're nothing like you are on stage. And Chris was like, people don't want to see me on stage. They want to see three times me. You don't go to, to a, 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 you don't watch a TV show. I mean, you watch reality TV, right? Is it really reality? No. Is, was Seinfeld really a representation of real life? No, it wouldn't have been a good show if it was. Reality TV wouldn't be really that fun if it was just reality, if it was your reality. We watch things like that to escape. We've been told for our entire lives to quote, be ourselves, but the reality is for the most part, we are pretty boring, all right? I would just come out and say, you are probably boring. <laughs> I'm pretty boring. It's, but those reality TV shows, those sitcoms, the movies, they're based on a three times version of reality. Even the biographical ones. If you think about a biography, you know, the movie Lincoln. I'm listening to the book Team of Rivals right now. It's 41, 42 hours long. And then you take the movie Lincoln is about a very specific point in his presidency. Now, he had one of the most exciting presidencies of all time, if you can call it that, because it's like, hey, you're president. Oh, by the way, half the country just left and there's going to be a war for your entire presidency. Good luck. But so you couldn't say that like most of his stuff was boring, but actually listening to the book, a lot of his time was spent with political appointments and meetings that quite frankly, weren't all that exciting. But you watch that movie and it's like, it's about this one point. Does that mean it's not true? No, we just took the part that was like the most exciting. So is there something about the way you write, about the way you talk, about the way you dress that makes you stand out a little? If so, what I want you to do is amplify it. So think about that. You know, you're like, you know, I, I dress a certain way. I, um, you know, I kind of like, I don't know. I, I have a, I don't you know, I have tattoos or something. Let me show off the tattoos a little bit. You know, I don't know how you would do that if it's like a back tattoo. That how you're gonna do that is kind of weird, but whatever. You know, but like, is there a way where you can do something like that? Um, you've got, you know, I don't know. You write in a way that's uh, a little bit kind of like dry. Okay, make it drier. You use sarcasm a little bit. Use more sarcasm. You see what I'm saying? So if you're funny, embrace the humor. Um, if you're a little weird, then be weirder when you write when you're on camera, if you have like this thick Boston accent, just forget the letter R even exists. All right. I went up there years ago and I, I pulled up and uh, I was apparently in the wrong lane at the airport. And the lady comes up and goes, where's the rest of your potty? Your patty. And I'm like, where's the rest of my potty? Like, what's up? I, I didn't bring a toilet with me. What, what, what's the deal here? You know, of course she was saying party, meaning other people who are with me. Well, there was no one with me, but you know, if you're born and raised in Alabama, like turn it up in all seriousness. I was born in a retirement area of North Carolina, lived to have my life in Tennessee a little bit in Georgia. And now I live in the Midwest. I don't have much of an accent. Some Northerners think I have a little bit of a Southern accent. Some Southerners think I sound like I'm from, well, the Midwest, you know? Um, so I don't really have one of those to turn up. But if you say, I mean, like in all seriousness, embrace that. Again, it's not not being yourself. If you're short, play into it. You know, if you're short, just play into it, right? Uh, 
acknowledge it and, and, and find ways. I, I, don't, I don't know. I almost made a joke about Oompa Loompas. Wait, dang it. I shouldn't have said that out loud, but whatever. If you're tall, then play it up. Yes, that was a pun. Uh, you know, play it up, right? Um, dye your hair. Go the mohawk. I don't know if it fits your, like wear a three-piece suit. Uh, if everybody else is in your industry is in a blazer, then, you know, play it up, wear a three-piece suit. If everyone else is wearing, you know, dress shirts, wear a plain white t-shirt. I, I don't know, like create a signature look. I promise you'll stand out more. One of the keys, like it just doesn't have to be complicated. Okay. You don't have to get a new wardrobe. You don't have to dye your hair. You don't have to start speaking in iambic pentameter. Um, it could be as simple as just going shoeless. A uh, good friend of mine, you know, Carrie, Carrie Wilkerson, she's known as the barefoot executive. And she, I mean, she's like, I've seen her speak from stage multiple times. She's got a great reputation. That wasn't always the case. Uh, that wasn't always the case. Like her, her, uh, her husband gave her this, this nickname, the barefoot executive. She was running several businesses, had two young children. And, and to quote her, she was fat, happy, and pregnant. That's her quote, just to be clear. All right. She emailed me that quote. So I'm not saying she was, well, she was pregnant and I'm hoping she was happy. She had, a, she had it all. She always hated to wear shoes though. Like me too. I, in my house, if I'm the only time I put on anything and it's usually flip-flops is when I got to go out to the garage. I have a thing about walking barefoot on the cold garage that I just don't do, you know, otherwise I'm always barefoot. I'm barefoot right now. Um, you know, like that's when she found that she was happy, you know, that she was the happiest. So she wore, <laughs> I love your comment. <laughs> Let me put that up on the, that's a great comment. Uh, trying to fix, sorry, trying to figure out how, how to play up a North American balding ape. Chad says, um, play up the bald man, you know, seriously, just play up the, oh, play up the bald. So She's like her competition, so to speak. They're wearing expensive shoes. They're being thinking about being judged for their shoes. And she, she said she embraced the country in her. She was barefoot and pregnant. And while that may be a negative stereotype, she used it to her advantage. It was, you could see on stage immediately, that woman is barefoot. And yet it became her calling card. It became her style allowed her to stand out. Even your liabilities can be assets. Um, great example of that, it, you know, I, th I always think of like Sylvester Stallone. Can you imagine um, if he didn't have that accent, like that, that little bit of slurred speech? I learned, I actually looked it up because I was kind of curious that when he, when his mom was in labor, uh, the doctors had to pull him out using forceps and they, they kind of like severed a nerve somewhere. He's got paralysis. That's what it is. The lower, I think it's the lower left, I'm trying to picture him. Yep, lower left side. Lower left side of his face has been paralyzed since birth. And so, of course, he was made fun of as a child. He was probably self-conscious. Wished he'd face those, like all those things, right? But this liability created a trademark look. I mean, can you even imagine Rocky without that look, without that voice? You know, Adrian, right? I mean, if, if it was just like, Adrian, the, the dumb, that wouldn't even be a famous line. He would not be the icon that we know today if not for that distinguishing style. My friend Darren Sargent, I wish I had his book. I don't think I have it handy. Uh, my, he was born, he had, uh, I think it's called um, ambiotic, no, <sighs> ambiotic band syndrome, I think is what it's called. Basically, he's got like from here down, he was just born without having an arm from there down. And, he, and I'm going to quote him here. He said, I have been born with a unique gift of having only one hand it has helped me to see life from a different perspective different perspective than most i believe what you read on my blog and in my books will reveal that to you will reveal that to you and in some way help you with the challenges that life seems to often bring our way he calls he's missing an entire appendage he calls that a unique gift one thing i know is he stands out like i remember years ago um, we had, we had barely known each other. We happened to be at Disneyland at the exact same time. And I wasn't looking for a middle-aged balding man. I was looking for a one-armed dude. And it was really easy to be like, Darren, you know, when he walks into a room full of antsy teenagers, tells them you can overcome any obstacle. 
Two-handed Darren doesn't stand a chance. One-handed Darren, on the other hand, is like gets immediate attention, right? It's a visible cue. It breaks down barriers, allows him to get his message through. So he turned this perceived liability into a huge asset. Your perceived liability, Chad, of being a, quote, balding ape could be one of your biggest advantages. Uh, Peter Falk's another one, you know, the guy who played Columbo. Uh, if you're too young to know that name, just Google it. Uh, but he had the, he had to squint, right? Uh, I just assumed that, you know, he, I don't know, he just was like sensitive to light. It was actually uh, some sort of a, I don't remember what it's called, like retino something or another, you know, somewhere or another. He had his right eye removed. And this artificial eye was what caused, you know, the, the, the squint. And I'm like, if you think about that, think about like that squint, the Columbo squint. One of the things that made him famous, you know, Owen Wilson's nose. Um, I have a scar, I forget on it. I mean, I can't even tell which side. It's, oh, it's over here. Got a dog, one of our dogs back in the day, just went right across my face. I have a scar there. But he like had a broken nose or something and never reset. Um, Kevin Hart's only 5'4", Andre the Giant 7'4". So, I mean, he's literally called Andre the Giant, you know, from uh, Princess Bride and, and wrestling. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's accent. Uh, he, uh, you know, I mean, he, he credits a lot of the success to the accent. Like, can you, you know, if it had been like, I'll be back, even though that's a unique accent, right? That would not have been iconic. If, um, you know, if Owen Wilson had, had that line, even... Bruce Willis, I'll be back. Learning you know how to do a Bruce Willis accent. Wouldn't have been famous, but because it was all be, like everybody, you know, we, we exaggerate that I'll be back. We, it was, that's not really how it sounded, but we always exaggerate. That's what made it an iconic line. Um, I think of like, you know, Joaquin Phoenix with the cleft lip. Um, you uh, Bono, uh, Bono, Bono from U2, um, the, the sunglasses. He has glaucoma. <laughs> He doesn't wear him to be cool. He, he has glaucoma. And so I, I could go on and on, right? But the lesson here is important. Reframe your disadvantages, right? Reframe your disadvantages. Think about how you can turn those disadvantages into advantages, how you can turn those liabilities into assets. So here's a couple questions for you. Number one, what disadvantages have you allowed to remain in your way? All right. And then secondly, what perceived liability something that's kind of weird about you, maybe. It's unusual. You're conscious about it. Could you use to actually build your brand? Could you use to stand out? Uh, if you want to know more about standing out, we, we talked about this last week, and attracting your ideal customers to join your email list, check out listlaunchchallenge.com. I'll copy that over for you. Um, check out listlaunchchallenge.com. Oh, looks like I cannot leave a comment. Oops. Um, so we'll put this here, listlaunchchallenge.com. Check that out. Um, it's, uh, let's see, cannot do it. It is a seven day training. It's not working. <laughs> um, no, I can't get it to work, but just check it out. Listlaunchchallenge.com. Sorry about that. I was going to put it up on the screen, um, or in the comments, but for some reason I am not able to drop a comment right now in my own Facebook live. That's weird without going to Facebook. And then I'd hear myself twice. Um, it's a seven day training all about growing your email list. So if you want to grow your email list fast, check that out at listlaunchchallenge.com. Okay. So number one is your style. We spent a lot of time on that because it's important. Number two is your experience. Your experience is, is your credentials, right? This is, uh, your pedigree, the degrees, you know, um, uh, you have, you have a PhD, something like that awards you've won, uh, places you've worked like this is your resume, right? So when I speak, when I go speak at an event, I always make sure that, like the, either the host or I mention the clients that I've worked with. So I say, I've worked with Michael Hyatt, Lewis Howes, Brian Tracy, Rich Sheffern, Jeff Goins, uh, Shark Tanks, Kevin Harrington, Ray Edwards, Stu McLaren, Zig Ziglar's company, Shutterfly, Adidas, and, and immediately gives me those credentials, right? Causes me to stand out. Just by listing my client roster, I mean, how does how do you get hired by Michael Hyatt and Lewis Howells and Zig Ziglar and Adidas and Shutterfly, all those guys, Rich Sheffern, who's a legend, Stu McCartney, how do you get hired by them if you're not an expert? 
I also make it a point to mention I'm a four-time affiliate manager of the year. You know, um, it's like I've worked with a diverse mix of people. So think through your own experience. Were you trained by someone well-known in your industry? That's your pedigree. Um, was one of your parents like famous? You know, just maybe within your niche, maybe your maybe your dad was like the guy who created the rocket that sent us to the moon. I don't know. And then talk about that. What degrees do you have? I, I've stated I, I I personally don't give a flying crap what degrees you have. I don't. But if your target audience does, then talk about that. Use them. You know, my friend Brian Dixon. He's a doctorate in edu what is it? educational technology, I think. I knew him for five years before I knew he, that he was Dr. Brian J. Dixon. I didn't know that. But when it serves him, you bet he uses those two letters in that period before his name. So what awards have you won? You don't have to be a Nobel Peace Prize winner to tout your awards, right? Um, I, I have a friend of mine. He, uh, he was a high school coach of the year. In, a, in like Arkansas, no, Missouri, one of the two, I don't remember, is Arkansas or Missouri, he was the high school coach of the year. He used that to get speaking gigs uh, with companies, with events in the leadership niche. He's a, he's a leadership guru now, commands more than $10,000 a speech from being a high school football coach of the year, like big whoop de doo right? So it doesn't have to be like some amazing award. Uh, you, you know, if you were employee of the year at, at Apple, that's kind of a big freaking deal. You know, if you were named, um, I don't know, nurse of the nurse of the year in your region, in your state, that's kind of a cool thing. Like that gives you some, uh, a little bit of street cred in the medical profession. You know, it doesn't have to be some dramatic thing. You don't have to be like worldwide medical professional of the year. Um, maybe you worked for like a well-known industry leading company. I mean, think about Silicon Valley, how many ex Google employees, ex Facebook employees are, are now considered experts in part because they were the third employee at Facebook. Um, Amy Porterfield is a good example of this. If you follow Amy, um, she worked for Tony Robbins and like she used Tony's name every chance she got for like the first 200 episodes of her podcast. You know, she would say like when I worked for Tony Robbins, when I worked for Tony Robbins, when I worked, but before she built her own name up, before she built her own authority, before she built her own brand, she leveraged Tony's name for her authority and as a way to stand out. So you might be thinking, what do I do if I don't have any of this? Like, I don't have any experience. I don't have the credentials, Matt. I don't have the awards. I don't have the degrees. It's still easy. If you don't have any of these things, the good news is lack of experience or a perceived lack of experience can actually work to your advantage. No matter what your situation, you can stand out. When I was 22 years old, I, I sort of touched on this earlier. If you read that article that I talked about earlier about me getting arrested, uh, it's tied to when I was 22 years old, I ran for the local school board. I don't know if this is still true. I, I, I haven't checked. I don't really care. But in 2002, at the time, I was the youngest person in North Carolina to ever make it through a primary election. I actually, I defeated two, I think two former school board members, a former principal who was like really known and well-loved in the, in the county, uh, a couple of, you know, former town council members, um, and almost got through the general election. You know, I almost got elected to the school board. I was 22 years old. I ran on the fact that I did not have a pedigree. I did not have the credentials. All right. I did not have letters after my name. I had never been an educator. I didn't even have children in the school. The average age of the people running against me was like 90 years old. That's it was like 55, 60 years old, but whatever. Most of them had run for local office before. Most of them had served in office before. One had a park named after her that I had to drive by every day. I'm like, yeah, I got a great chance of beating her. I'd only moved to the county like a year and a half before. I, I, I was up against this stiff competition. Right? There, was only, there was only one thing I could find that I could amplify that caused me to stand out. And that was the fact that I was young. So I would joke at the very beginning of speeches and I'd say like, well, you may have noticed that I'm young. I remember where there's, we were in a debate and the this other candidate was like, I've had 37 years as an educator. And I said, I was born 15 years into your time as an educator. <laughs> and like, I joked that one candidate's oldest grandson and I graduated high school in the same year. And I reminded them why this was an advantage. I, my slogan was a new age in education. 
And so I was this fresh face. I was somebody I could relate to today's students, right? That's why I was an ideal candidate. I had no business making it through the primary. I was outspent, out-credentialed, a complete unknown, and yet I was able to use my experience, or in this case, lack thereof, as an advantage. And so unlike style, it's kind of hard to amplify your experiences, you would think. But I, if I said I'm a 12-time affiliate manager of the year when I've only won it four times, that's a lie. Maybe not in eight years. I don't know. We'll see. But like, that's a lie, right? But you can play them up. You can play them up. Focus on your own unique experiences. That's me. That's why for me, it's my client roster. It's my own performance in affiliate competition. Nobody has that unique combination of experience. I, I don't think there's anyone in the world who runs as many, many affiliate programs as we do and works for the kind of clients who do and participates in big affiliate launches and does really well. If someone else were to try to compete with me in my niche, I would advise them not to go toe to toe with me in those areas. I cannot think of anyone who has worked with so many high level entrepreneurs, won as many awards and done as well as I have in affiliate competition. And I don't say that to brag. I say that to say, okay, if they're going to stand up, they're going to stand out on something else, not that. So, you know, maybe they worked for, maybe they ran the affiliate program for Apple. What, well, you know, Shutterfly and Adidas don't, are not as big as that. So I, I would be like, you know what, focus on that. If they have a Harvard MBA, and they're an affiliate manager. Okay, play that up, right? Maybe they're newer to the game. I, I talk about, I've been doing this since 2005. I've been in this for a long time. They could talk about how they only started four years ago and they have a, a you know, fresh perspective. Basically, if you want to compete against me, by the way, I just gave you the playbook. <laughs> you know, So think about your own experiences. How are they unique? This isn't about being better. Is it better to have a Harvard MBA than to not? It depends on the field. But how can you be unique? So I want you to, I'm, I'm gonna, at the end of this, I've got some questions for you that we're going to go through. I've got some exercises I want you to go through. Um, go ahead now though, like think about what, what are some of the ways that you, your experiences make you unique? Uh, speaking of, you know, being unique and standing out and capturing the attention of prospective fans, just want to remind you, check out List Launch Challenge at listlaunchchallenge.com listlaunchchallenge.com. Uh, just type that in. Uh, I'd love to give you the link, but the comments aren't working for me right now on my end. I don't know why, but check out listlaunchchallenge.com and, and we will help you in just seven days to grow your email list. All right. So we talked about style. We talked about experience. The third thing is your personal background. Okay. Now this sounds a lot like experience. Like, well, I went to, you know, I have a Harvard MBA and then the part of my background, no, this is more like your personal story, your upbringing, your successes, your failures. All right. These are the, um, like, what are the unique aspects of your life that have shaped you? What is it that made you are like made you who you are today? I, I talk about me, right? I, I had a single mom. I often joke that while we managed to live on the quote unquote right side of the tracks, my mom had to work three jobs just to keep us there. And I could see the other side from my bedroom window, right? Immediately, I stand out from anyone who grew up with both parents or grew up wealthy. But then, you know, the, the crazy thing is I was, I was sharing this with somebody the other day. The, the unique thing is I grew up with a single mom, but I also had a couple of fairly well-off relatives that I got to spend some time with. So I saw both sides. And we were talking about in the context of, you know, how most people, when they grow up with a single mom, poor and with a single mom, th they kind of just stay there, right? They, that, they don't know what's out there. They don't know anything different. I knew there was something different, so I wasn't going to be boxed in. And then when I was nine years old, I, uh, I moved to live with my dad. And um, my dad, like within a couple of years, three years after I moved to live with him, he went from making about $40,000 a year to six figures. And while throughout high school, I still lived in a, you know, one bedroom apartment. Um, we didn't really need, you know, we weren't like, what's the word pretentious or ostentatious with our, like, we didn't go buy a big house. We could have afforded it, but I got to travel the country. I got to play in elite golf tournaments. Um, I got to, you know, I mean, I got to do the most amazing things in the world. Um, eventually I got a scholarship to play golf at the university of Tennessee. And so, I mean, they're like being a division one athlete makes me stand out. It's kind of funny. Like 
um, there's, I'm not making fun of people, but my, one of my favorite comedians is a guy named Michael Jr. Um, and I've had the opportunity to hang out with him a few times and he's just an amazing guy. One of the jokes he talks about is like, you ever notice how, if like people where people, where people went to college, how they answer the question. It's like, if, you know, somebody went to like, you know, university of Tennessee, it's like, where'd you go? Tennessee. Oh, blah, blah, really? Well, that's all, you know, blah, blah. Um, if they go to, uh, if they go to a community college, it's like, well, you know, um, see what was supposed to happen was, uh, man, I was going to, you know, I was like, I got out of high school and then, uh, and my sister, man, you know, she, my sister with, and then, you know, like, and it's like this whole story about, <laughs> and, and, you know, but that's like, the point is when I say Tennessee, it, it sets me apart. Being a division one college athlete is an important part of when I talk about topics such as discipline and competitiveness and focus, because you got to have those things to play D one sports. Uh, most people don't know this, but golfers miss more class than any other sport. Football barely misses any class. I miss like a few classes a year. You know, we missed like there was a three week stretch in the spring where I missed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, back to back to back. So the discipline to be able to, you know, get to the golf course when we, you know, we have an eight o'clock tea time and we wouldn't finish till six o'clock at night and then practice for a few minutes after and then go to dinner and come back and study. I remember I was leading a golf tournament in Rhode Island once and it was a brutal day. It was cold and rainy and windy, right? We were playing up at Newport, Rhode Island and it took like a six and a half hours round. I was so tired. I went back. I fell asleep in the hotel at 4 p.m. They woke me up at 7 to go to dinner. I got back at like 8.30. And as tired as I was, I had to study for an exam that I had that Friday. That was discipline. Your story, your personal experience, your, your, um, your background doesn't have to be all sunshine and rainbows, though. All right. Um, I talk about, you know, falling out of a tire swing. Uh, I was like 40 feet up. I was telling my kids, it, I was like 40 feet up and it's probably like 20 feet, but maybe like 15. It felt like 40 at the time though. I was like nine, seven or eight years old. I don't even think I was nine. And, you know, I fell and broke both my arms. I share how I had childhood epilepsy. I grew up in trailer parks until I moved to live with my dad. I moved 13 times in 14 years. All of these things are important parts of my story that allow me to stand out. So one of the things you can do there is, is highlight your obstacles. You know, what's, what's part of your unique personal background that's, um, that you've overcome? What are some of the hard knock lessons you've learned? What are some of the challenges starting your business or, or getting fit or bad dates or sales calls that tanked, uh, experiments that you've done that have gone wrong? Like you got to show that you're human, right? Show that you, okay, okay, you made mistakes, but you overcame the mistakes. You overcame the obstacles that life dealt you. And when you do this, you show others that they can overcome those similar obstacles, right? They can learn from their mistakes. If you're a single mom and that sets you apart, if you're a single mom in an industry that's mostly, you know, married moms, then use that. They would tell you, I've talked to so many single moms, they would tell you it's the highlight of their lives, but it's also a challenge. It's an obstacle. And so use that part of your story to, to show others that they can overcome whatever obstacle stands in their way. Um, in a sense, your own personal challenge to become a proxy for theirs. Just remember, you're the only one who has your story. I, I don't even have to get too deep into to my story to know it's unique amongst all the world's population. I mean, how many award-winning affiliate managers are there? 30? alive, 25. I don't know how many of them have a successful platform that teaches others how to make money online. I don't, not very many. How many of those are married with two kids have played division one athletics, uh, have built a company from scratch to more than $18 million in revenue by the age of 27 have slept on their mom's fold out couch in her living room. You know, um, I mean like the event, the answer eventually becomes none of them. Your story is unique too, though. That's the thing. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to write out your story. What are the highlights and what are the lowlights? What are the what are the what are the mountaintop experiences and what are the valleys? What are what are the stories within your bigger story that you can tell over and over again to make a point? You've some of you already knew those things. 
You knew I played golf at the University of Tennessee. You knew that I'd been arrested when I was 22. Some of you didn't, but there are certain stories I talk about a lot. So what aspects of your life, what aspects of your background, your circumstances set you apart? So think about that. What are those things? Um, I'll share some exercises later where I'll walk through that. But the important time is just take the, take the time. Again, write it out. Write out and just think, okay, what were those highlights? I won that award. I had that experience. I got into an argument with a coworker and here's what happened. That's an experience. That's a background thing. You got fired from a job. I, I don't know what they are. You had a major illness. You lost a child. I, I literally don't know what they are. But but for you, they're unique and it allows you to stand out. All right, the last way to stand out. Number four. So we talked about style, experience, and background. Fourth one is your method. All right, your method is the way that you do things. All right, the way that you get your message out to the world. So um, if, uh, you know, you're going to write blog posts, you're going to host a podcast or record videos. Just, you know, there I'm going to guess that roughly – a third of your, your com- competition is doing each of those. So already you're in the one third that's doing one of those. Uh, if it's a podcast, is it going to, or video, is it going to be interview uh, or solo? Uh, you're going to do your content live or pre recorded. You'll notice I don't do a whole lot of pre recorded videos. I used to, but I don't. I do them live and then we share them, you know. Um, is your content going to be, you know, um, are you going to do like one thing a week and it's going to be like epic and long, or are you going to do shorter frequent stuff like Seth Godin? Uh, are you going to use personal stories or case studies? Are you going to sell physical products or digital products? Are you going to teach a specific system or, or not? Right. This is a, it's, it's a way of distinguishing yourself in the industry. If you study online, successful online entrepreneurs, they have something about their method that sets them apart or at least puts them in a, in a small minority within their niche. So what are some of those ways that you can do that? Number one, content delivery, all right? The content delivery. If, if you look at your niche and everyone's doing videos, do a podcast or do a written blog post. You say, well, but no, but this is a video is the way to go because everyone's doing video. You might only capture 5% of the audience, the potential audience, but you're going to capture all the people out there who are watching the videos because it's the only thing out there and go, I just wish there was something written. I just wish there was a way to get this written. If everyone else is doing an interview style podcast then do solo or have a host, if everyone, you know, like length, right? Um, when I think of great bloggers, I think of, you know, one of my favorite guests of all time was Seth Godin um, on the podcast. He does not release like epic 5,000 word blog posts that do a deep dive. His, his, his podcast or his, uh, uh, not podcast, his blog posts are like a hundred words. It's like a little daily nugget. I don't know, maybe 150 words on average. I don't know. He stands out because he's basically saying, come to me daily, spend like two minutes, bada boom, bada bang. Think you're out. Most of his posts are not life-changing. They do not lead to some seismic shift in my business, but they have a small impact that over time leads to massive success. Um, you know, fit personal stories versus case study. This can be a big differentiator. When you focus on your own story, which just as, as I said earlier, it needs to represent the story of your avatar, then it's different than case studies. Neither is better. Neither of those is better. It's just, if you look at it and it's like, man, everybody in my niche is doing personal stories and I want to share other people's stories. Um, That's, you know, that's standing out. Uh, Same thing with digital, you know, versus, um, uh, you know, physical products. Uh, One of the reasons that Michael Hyatt stands out is he has a lot of physical products. You know, he has the the full focus planner and, and his books and other things that, allowing to stand out in a market that's pretty much all digital. Uh, your system, you know, I think of a system, you think of like uh, Ryan Levesque, you know, has the ask method. Michael Hyatt has his free to focus productivity system. Uh, my friend Susie Moore, who I was just texting with, has their, her five minutes to famous system for getting started, like f- getting featured on big media. Jeff Walker has uh, the product launch formula for, well, 
launching products. Um, <laughs> yeah, like Rachel Miller has her grow your audience course to help business owners grow their Facebook audience. There's a system, right? There's a unique proven step-by-step -step formula for achieving a specific result. That's what, that's what a formula is. And this system is what stands out. It stands out because they develop it. They own it. They're known for it. Like, like they become inseparable from each other. You know, I think of, of marketing systems like, you know, Jeff's PLF, Ryan's ask method are the first two that come to mind in part because they're, you know, friends and one of them is a client. So I, I'm naturally close to those, but like, even before I worked with them, they were, they were ubiquitous. Right? It was like, I, like there are people who follow um, their systems and don't even know that Jeff and Ryan invented them. That's the kind of market penetration that a system can earn you. Like they are so, they dive so deep into marketing concepts and strategies that, I mean, it took my team and I three months to finish PLF, nearly two months to finish the Ask Masterclass. There's nothing wrong with that kind of system. I learned so much from both, you know, both courses. Um, and I credit, I mean, I credit both of them. You know, Michael Hyatt's Free to Focus uh, course, on the other hand, it took me like three days to complete and less than a couple of weeks to implement. I give him a lot of credit too for my success, just as much as Jeff and Ryan. Their system and their style are different. And we found that for our business, Michael's model worked better. So in 2020, um, you know, we released uh, a course called Find Affiliates Now. And if you want to, the name kind of says it all, by the way, if you want to find affiliates now, go to findaffiliatesnow.com. Um, so go to findaffiliatesnow.com and, and check that out. The total content in the course is less than 90 minutes. And I brag about that. I brag about that because it's getting results. Each lesson's like 15 minutes long. I think the longest one's like 23 minutes. And it's focused on the most important activity you should take each day for five days. That's it, five days to find affiliates. It is not a detailed outline of everything that someone could or should do. It's not a history of affiliate programs. It's not every lesson I could ever teach about running an affiliate program. It's like, and I didn't, I mean, I've got, I've been in this industry for nearly 20 years. I didn't put it all into a 60 hour course. It's 15 minutes for five days. That's it. And that's the thing is that stands out. That's a way to stand out. At the end of those five days, students are like, I did it. I, 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 I got what the course promised. They found, they reached out to, they signed up dozens of affiliate partners, right? And then a few weeks, they've more than paid for the course. In other words, it gets results. That's the thing. Uh, again, you can find that at findaffiliatesnow.com. So standing out, your method, there's there's ways to just, they're just you're just different, right? Uh, another one is, you know, no product, no problem. When I first created that course, I wanted it to be like PLF. So I was like, oh, this, this has to be like a 500 hour, and it was like 44 hours long. It was like, this has to be like epic, right? Well, we had success with Find Affiliates now. So we took in the NP, we completely re-engineered it. It's a five-day course. This one, it's like two and a half hours, I think. Um, and people are like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm experiencing success with this course. This is working so well. You know, and that's, that's the thing that's become our MO that's become our mod modus operandi. It's like short courses focused on what you need to know the most, right? We're focused on the 80, 20, nothing you don't need to know, no theory, no all that. It's like all focused on taking action, all focused on taking action. Um, in fact, I mentioned list launch challenge, growing your list. Uh, that's the longest program that we offer. It's seven days. <laughs> it's a seven day course. It is the longest course that we offer. Uh, again, you can find that at listlaunchchallenge.com. So real quick, as we wrap up, I want to share five attention triggers, okay? These are ways to stand out, to capture that attention um, in, in, in the marketplace, right? And again, we take a deep dive into these into listlaunchchallenge.com. So check that out at listlaunchchallenge. Or I just said listlaunchchallenge.com, yeah. Uh, well, Go to listlaunchchallenge.com, join Listlaunch Challenge, and we're going to take a deep dive into these attention triggers. So I'm not going to go like super deep, but I'm going to give you like a brief summary of each. All right. So number one is a pattern disrupt. All right. Um, your audience has a certain set of expectations. Uh, there's, there's a very familiar chord progression. It's F, C, G, or G, D, C, E minor. G, like 
name a song howie days collide um which I, think, I think brown eyed girl uh walkaways by counting crows i'm just trying to uh, uh uh zombie by the cranberries so you got howie days collide if you know that song it's like a love song and then you got zombie by the cranberries it's the exact same chord progression basically so what happens when you hear g c d and then it's suddenly followed by f kind of throws people off or f c g like the next note has to be a minor <laughs> if you go f c g and then like you know d it's like that's kind of weird and so if the note is different though it captures their attention when you upset these expectations people have no choice but to perk up and give you their attention right so these pattern disrupts it could be something bizarre it could be something quirky it could be something downright controversial <laughs> um you know stay on brand don't be so weird that you like creep people out be so off the wall that people miss your message so um, think about these questions. Number one, how can you challenge the expectation that your avatar has? In other words, how can you play that unexpected note? How can you take a stand that is controversial or against the norm? And what commonly accepted myths or beliefs can you destroy? Again, don't just think about the, go, oh, those are great questions. No, I want you to write the questions down. And then I want you to answer them later. Maybe you're not going to take a controversial stand, but you're going to challenge an unaccepted myth or belief in your industry. All right. Trigger number two is reward. All right. Trigger number two is reward. We love to be rewarded. All right. This captures our attention because we're allowed, we're, we got rewarded and we're able to focus on what a marketer is attempting to deliver. Right. When you, we talked about this two weeks ago, when you surprise and delight your prospects, they give you their attention. And so for most of us, we like to be rewarded. So here's a couple questions to answer. Number one, what short-term rewards can I offer my avatar to capture their attention? Right? What's short-term? Like it's a quick win. And secondly, how can I connect with my avatar in a way that makes them feel that they're being rewarded, that they're being rewarded for being in my audience? Third, prestige. Um, if you're, if you're like me, <laughs> you might be old enough to remember a time. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Like if you remember when you, there was this, uh, this commercial back in, I don't know. It was like the mid to late eighties, maybe early nineties. There was an actor. Uh, he was wearing this white lab coat and he was pitching this product that was basically for senior citizens, right? They ran for more than a decade. Like I th these, these ads spanned like middle school through college for me, I think. So that, Maybe it was, I think they ended like right when I started college. So I guess I think they were kind of like, like 87 to 97, somewhere in that range. That means they were effective, right? They had disclaimers, like you could not miss them. Staying in fact, this is an actor. This is not a real doctor yet. People believe his claims. Why? Because that one thing I mentioned, one thing, he was wearing a white coat. If he had gone on wearing this shirt, the white lab coat, the white lab coat. There was a study done in the UK and it said that uh, people were more likely to remember a message from a healthcare professional when they were wearing a stethoscope around their neck than when they weren't. They didn't even have to use the, steth the steth stethoscope. That is such a hard word for me. It just had to be present. It just had to be around their neck. They could have a beautiful pearl necklace or a stethoscope. Which one are they going to believe? The stethoscope. Credibility, right? Knowledge, authority, prestige. Uh, there was another study that showed uh, Robert Cialdini. Who, by the way, they just released a new version of the book Influence. And I think it might be from that um, initially. I can't remember where it's from. And it was like, people are like five times more likely to follow a man crossing the street against a red light if he was wearing a suit rather than just casual attire. All, it's just a small little symbol of prestige a stethoscope, a suit, right? It's a trust symbol. You know, that's why, that's why I shared. That's why I share so much. I say I've worked with Zig Ziglar's company and Shark Tank's Kevin Harrington, Michael Hyatt, Lewis House, Stu McLaren, Brian Tracy, this goes on and on. Certain level of reputation, authority, and prestige. 
So some questions for you here. Number one, what are some trust symbols? What's your stethoscope that you can use to demonstrate prestige, believability, and credibility in your niche? What's your stethoscope? What's your, what's your suit? What's your white lab coat, right? Secondly, what are other influencers in your niche doing to increase their perceived reputation and prestige? Study them. Okay, so look around and then study them. And maybe you want to stand out. Maybe they're doing all white lab coats and you're going to stand out by being the wild hippie. I don't know. Maybe they're going to be the three-piece suit and you're going to stand out with the tattoos and the mohawk or just wearing a t-shirt. You know, it doesn't have to be like extreme. All right. Fourth, uncertainty. Okay. This is the fourth trigger. Uh, if you remember the days before net, I keep going back to like the eighties and nineties, right? Um, you know, we watched our favorite TV shows and I remember one, um, like I, I watched it with a group of friends. I would get, this is like back in the you know high school times. <clears throat> and we would, we, we'd show up, we'd get there like 10 minutes early, 20 minutes early. We'd eat some snacks. We'd talk. Maybe we'd get there like right on time. Even sometimes I say 10, 20 minutes early, usually about five, 10 minutes early. We'd, you know, we'd enjoy the show together. And then at the end of the hour, this hour long show, we're expecting a resolution, but we got those three dreaded words to be continued. No resolution, no finality, no answers to all of the questions that had accrued over the course of this episode or this season. And now we have to wait an entire freaking week or an, an entire season. Like we have to wait like 36 weeks to find out what happened. It was infuriating. But guess what? Let's just say it was at the end of a season. Then for the next 30 weeks, we talked about what might have happened. We filled in the gaps with our own like theories, our own hypotheses. We, we made guesses about whether or not that one character was still alive or if our two favorite characters were finally going to get together or not. And when the next episode aired, we didn't get there 10 minutes early, 20 minutes early. We got there like an hour early. We didn't want to take any chances that we were going to miss this. This is a fictional show. Unrealistic portrayal of life, but it had our attention. Uncertainty works like that. It works like a cliffhanger. When people don't know what's going to happen next or they don't understand something, they pay attention until that uncertainty is resolved. That's a key right there. Until their questions are answered or all their curiosity is satisfied, you have their attention. You have their attention. So some questions here. Some questions here on this. Number one, how can you create uncertainty in your content? These are called incomplete storylines, all right? Incomplete storylines. Uh, we send an email telling the story of the time our company tried a new strategy with our affiliates. And we'll talk about how we conceived of it and how we executed it. Might even share how it worked, but I'm not going to share the overall results or share how they can do it. Those are revealed in the next email. You know, there's a reason why the eighth Harry Potter movie and the ninth Star Wars movie did so well. People want closure. So how can you create uncertainty in your content and keep your avatar on their toes? Secondly, think of three problems you can solve in succession. All right, in succession. So you solve the first problem in the first email or the first podcast episode, but there's a new problem because of that thing or the next problem, boom, boom. And you do that three, just do three. If you have four, it's fine. We call this, you know, Jeff Walker, came up with this. It's called the PSP path. So it's the problem solution problem. So it's like the problem is uh, you, you don't know how to do this. Pro you know, you don't know how to find affiliates. Well, I show you, I show you, I give you, or, you know, whatever, but you don't know how to do this and you don't know how to do this. And it keeps going, right? So uncertainty as a trigger. And the fifth trigger is recognition. People love being recognized. People love being recognized. People uh, that's why I love doing live lessons because I can say, hey, David, thank you, by the way, for dropping the links. David, you're amazing. Thank you, Chad, for being on today. You know, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Brenda. You know, people love that, right? Um, when a celebrity calls out a fan by name, the, the reaction from that fan goes viral. Because, ah, Justin Bieber said my name, you know. Um, people will engage with you because you remind them of who they want to be. And so they will share your content because your content is a representation of who they aspire to be. 
So recognize them, empathize with them, help them get to where they want to go. So questions here, how can you recognize individual followers? How can you recognize individual followers and create some more connection with them? That's why I love connecting with, you know, you guys uh, text me anytime. 260-217-4619. Um, Chad and I, I, I said this last time, you know, Chad and I were just texting the other day, you know, um, you know, Chad Condon, I mean, he's on here and, and we've really connected. So how can you create more connection with them? How can you best represent your av who your avatar wants to be? How can you best represent who they want to be? Now, I've got a few more exercises. I've got six more exercises, but I just want to do a quick recap. Uh, number one, uh, how do you stand out? Your style and your personality, your experience, your personal background, all right? Your method. And then um, the, the triggers that we talked about, right? The five attention triggers. Uh, you've got, um, I'm probably going to go out of order here, but you've got um, recognition that we just talked about, you know, actually recognizing people. We started with the pattern disrupt, right? The pattern disrupt, uh, reward, prestige, that uncertainty. Um, I changed the last, no, it is still called recognition. I thought, cause I, I recently changed the terminology I used for that one. Cause I didn't like the old terminology. I don't even remember what it was. I think it was just called, re, uh, the last one was called, um, I don't remember. So I've changed the name on two of those, but those are the attention triggers, right? Well, again, we go into depth in all of those in list launch challenge. Uh, if you just check out listlaunchchallenge.com, if you want to grow your list, whether, let's say you're at zero and you want to get to a hundred. Or maybe you're maybe you got a couple hundred subscribers and you want to get to like you know a couple thousand. Check out listlaunchchallenge.com. All right, so I've mentioned these exercises. Um, I've got six exercises for you, based on what we've talked about here. Number one, what are some ways that you can stand out in your writing style, in your appearance, your speaking, or other visible ways? Okay, these are things that people will immediately notice. Man, he writes differently, and I kind of like it. And here's the deal on that on all these. Maybe maybe you have maybe you dress down, and they're like, I don't like that. That's fine. Five percent, ten percent of your potential audience will love it. That's all you want. You know, really, you only need like a couple percent. You know, I think about uh, there's a client of ours, and they work with accountants. And if they're the accountants that don't look like accountants, and they only attract two percent of all the accountants in the world, cool. They're gonna have like a half a million potential clients or something. It's ridiculous, right? Um, maybe not that many. Okay. Secondly, what's an embarrassing story from your past that you could use to share that would build connection with your avatar? I talked about me being arrested, right? This will help you establish trust, serve to illustrate a lesson to your avatar. So what's that embarrassing story? Third, what liability could you turn into an asset to capture attention? Write that down or liabilities. Fourth exercise, list out your experiences, your credentials, your awards, your places you've worked, anything that could be used to help you stand out. And you're like, oh, well, yeah, you know, the only like, cool place I've worked was such and such, you know, write it down. Well, the only award I've won, remember I talked about the guy was high school coach of the year, what did he do? But he used that to build a speaking career. So write all of those things down. Fifth, do you have a unique method or system? And if not, consider how you could develop that system now. Okay, how, how can you zig when others in your niche are zagging, basically? And then sixth, I want you to pick one attention trigger. There's five of them that we talked about, right? Just pick one of them. One attention trigger to focus on for now. Really hone in on that one trigger. And, and get good at that one trigger for months before adding another, okay? Eventually, you will add another. I don't care. Just pick one. You just look at that list and you're like, you know what? The 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 one that I really, I think uncertainty is going to be my thing. Or you're like, no, no, no. It's going to be prestige. I've got a pretty good reputation. I'm going to use prestige. I don't care which one you use. Just pick one and use it and really stick with that for at least a few months before you add another one. All right. So it's, that's how we, we stand out out today. I don't care. Super crowded niche in a, in a niche that's, you know, packed. You got tons of competition. Take what we talked about today. Stand out in your niche.
make sure you do check out list launch challenge at listlaunchchallenge.com if you want to start growing your list. If you want to create a lead magnet that stands out, that's what lesson number one is all about. If you want to create a, a way for people to subscribe to you, grow your email list potentially from zero to hundreds or even thousands. Uh, James Kalita, we tell his story throughout List Launch Challenge. Um, he went from z- literally zero to 3,200 subscribers in 84 days because of List Launch Challenge. I can tell you what 3,200 subscribers you can do. You can almost go full-time. You can't quite go full-time typically with 3,200 you can get about, you're about halfway there, maybe a little bit over halfway. You're like 60% of the way to go in full-time. We found four to 5,000 subscribers is typically where people can comfortably go full-time. Um, so if you want to be like James, you know, I can't promise the same results, of course. He busted it, but he went from zero to 3,200 subscribers in 84 days with what we teach in List Launch Challenge. So go check that out at listlaunchchallenge.com. And if you have any questions about what we talked about today, or anything about List Launch Challenge or any of our other you know, products, you ever have any questions or just questions in general, text me at 260-217-4619. 260-217-4619. And I will see you guys next week. Um, next week, I'm trying to think what we're talking about. I don't remember. <laughs> and I don't have Robbie on to tell me. So, it's going to be super awesome, though. I know that much. Let me see. Actually, I can pull it up here. Uh, tell you what we guys are, what we are talking about next week on September 2nd, how to run an affiliate program for subscription services. So membership sites and, you know, masterminds, ongoing like money recurring payments. If you've got an affiliate program for those type of things, I'm going to share how to run one of those successfully. So come back and join us on Thursday, September 2nd, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.